All right, this is the last lecture. This is part three of types of reactions or chemical reactions, and we're going to talk about oxidation reduction reactions. As you see in this um, little cartoon, um, hopefully you can figure this out. This is just a joke, money laundering, and this is salt and a battery, a salt and battery, because oxidation reduction reactions are what causes batteries to work. So, um, as you know, we've already studied precip precipitation and acid base. Now is our last type. And you'll notice that a lot of these original types of reactions, not really double replacement, but decomposition, single displacement, combustion, and synthesis, most of the time, should fall into this oxidation reduction category. So, what is oxidation reduction? And from now on, I'll say the word redox. That's just a short form of it that is very commonly used. This is a different kind of reaction where electrons are transferred from one substance to, to another, and that is really what's happening inside batteries. A chemical reaction occurs that causes the production of electricity, that flow of electrons. That will be studied in more detail in Unit 9. So what is oxidation? Well, it is when electrons are lost by one substance, and if electrons are lost by one substance, then there must be another substance there to be reduced because those the substance that is reduced is gaining those electrons. So a couple of mnemonic devices that are extremely helpful. Um, I highly recommend you remembering one or the other just so you keep these two processes straight is oil rig, oxidation involves loss of electrons, and reduction involves gain, or Leo the Lion says GER, meaning losing electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction. And again, we can't have one process without the other. So let's just look at this. Um, you know, we said reduction, again, you could either think of rig, of oil rig, or GER. But what we're looking for is reduction involving gain of electrons or gaining electrons is reduction. So either one of those. Now, electrons are negative, so you've got to keep that into, in, as a reminder. So look at those examples. Two are going to be oxidation, and two will be the answer as reduction. Hopefully you came up with um, the, the copper 2 plus ion plus 2 electrons yields copper solid. Notice we have plus two going to zero. What would cause an oxidation number? Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute to go down in value. And that's a key point here. Reduction involves gaining of negative electrons, but actually the oxidation number, as you see, this charge goes down. Copper is plus two. Solid copper has no overall um, charge. Um, and that is gaining negatives, electrons. So same thing with aluminum. We have a three plus charge, or we're gonna learn about oxidation numbers in a minute. So three electrons would be gained to go to zero. The other two processes um, that were given, those are oxidation. And notice oxidation involves loss of electrons. So losing electrons makes the value actually go up losing negatives, it's gonna become a more positive value. So sometimes that's the easiest way to keep oxidation and reduction straight is what's happening to these values. Is it being reduced, which is reduction, or is it increasing, which is oxidation? And the other thing I wanna point out is loss of electrons. We should see electrons on the product side for oxidation and for reduction, it's gaining electrons and they should be a reactant. So just a couple of reminders as to how to keep these straight. Okay, I've already mentioned the term oxidation number, so let's go into a little bit more detail with that and make sure you understand what oxidation numbers are. These are really numbers assigned to an atom in a compound or an ion. And as we saw with our previous example, when we have just a single atom like copper, and that was its solid form, or when we see a copper two plus ion, their oxidation numbers are really easy to see. They're really just charges. Copper doesn't have a charge, so we already said that was zero. And copper two plus, its oxidation number is that charge plus two. Now, that is really simple, but it, it's like, what do we do when we have a polyatomic ion like the permanganate ion? 
because what we need to be able to do is we need to have an individual oxidation number for manganese and for oxygen within this ion. So there are some rules I want to go over with you. And once you, these aren't rules you really have to necessarily memorize. Once you've used them a few times, it's just become second nature. So looking at these guidelines, um, anytime we have any form of an element, it's oxidation number zero. So we've already seen copper, iron, sodium, any diatomic molecule, you know, there are seven of those, oxygen, hydrogen are two of them. And then there are some other forms of nonmetals. They're called allotropes, like P4. Another one that comes to mind is S8. If you basically just have an, one, an atom of an element, and even though it might have an odd subscript here, there's no overall charge, so we know those are all zero. If we just have a monatomic ion, and again, that's just a one atom ion, it's whatever the charge is. We already saw copper two plus, copper is also plus one. Okay, so again, it's just a one atom ion. So we've seen copper two plus, copper plus one. Just these are, there are many examples of this. I just tried to pick out some metals that have positive charges and then non-metals with their, so whatever the negative charge is or whatever the positive charge is, that is the oxidation number. Now, anytime we have fluoride, it's gonna be negative one. But again, if we had F2, the element, that would be zero. Okay, so fluoride in a compound is negative one. Number four, hydrogen is gonna be plus one. That's when it's like in an acid um, because it's with a non-metal that is, would take a negative, um, in this case chloride would have to be negative one. But if hydrogen is bonded to a metal, remember that's where we call it hydride, for the example, sodium hydride, and then it would be negative one. So hydrogen, most commonly positive one. In some cases, it could be negative one. All right, five, oxygen in a compound or polyatomic ion. You're going to see oxygen, and this is going to be almost all the time, is going to be negative two. So here's barium oxide, water. Again, we're going to look at permanganate ion again. Any polyatomic ion, its most common charge, it's like each oxygen, like in this polyatomic ion, is going to be negative two. There are a few times, and we will see this with redox reactions, that we will have the substance hydrogen peroxide. And since hydrogen can only be plus one when it's with a nonmetal, that's where we have this ion. You may not have seen this very much before, but this is one case where oxygen is negative one. For C, oxygen and this is, seems a little strange, but fluoride always gets to be negative one. So if oxygen is actually bonded to fluorine, which we can see this randomly, oxygen would have to take on a positive role. In this case, it would be positive two. And number six, oxidation numbers in a compound must equal zero. We'll go through some examples and I'll show you what that looks like. And then number seven, the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion must equal the charge of that ion. So here's some we can try um, again, number one, nitrogen, N2. Hopefully you'd realize that it's an element. Number, number one, and then number two, we have phosphide ion, so its oxidation number is going to be its charge. And then this is what I was saying with a compound. In a compound, the oxidation numbers have to equal zero. So we know lithium is a group one metal. It's typically plus one is um, the lithium ion, so its oxidation number is plus one, and then we know chloride is typically um, Cl minus, I mean, and then it, in that case it would be, so plus one, plus minus one, together those equals zero, so that's kind of what that meant. Same thing with aluminum, um, and we'll assign oxygen its normal oxidation number, so um, if we start with aluminum, we have two aluminums, they each or positive three, so the total of all the aluminums together is plus six. And then we have three oxygens, and each oxygen is, has a negative two oxidation number. So the total of all the oxygens is negative six, so positive six plus negative six does equal zero. So that is obeying that 
um, compounds have a total of zero oxidation number. Now here for five and six we have ions, so again when we add up the oxidation numbers it's got to equal, the, the sum of the oxidation numbers has to equal the charge. Now when you have a polyatomic ion I would that contains oxygen, start with the oxygen because remember I said very commonly oxygen is going to be negative two in a polyatomic ion. So we don't just have one oxygen, we have four. So four times negative two, so all the oxygens are negative eight. So it's really like a little math problem. It's sulfur's number, because there's only one sulfur, plus negative eight is got to equal negative two overall. So what is sulfur going to be? Well, sulfur would have to be plus six in that case. So that would be my answer if I was asked about like maybe sulfur's oxidation number. And then let's look at um, the ammonium ion. Again, hydrogen with a nonmetal is plus one. So we have four hydrogens. So the total of the hydrogens is positive four. So what would nitrogen have to be so that uh, the total so again, the total has to be, in this case, positive one. So we would know that to fill in this, nitrogen would have to be negative three. And there are the details of all that I just went over. If you didn't catch on to one, or if this is maybe easier to read since it's typed. Okay, so why in the world, why do we even have to do this? Well, this knowing oxidation numbers is the way we can tell if oxidation and reduction is occurring. Because sometimes if we assign oxidation numbers to a reaction and none of the oxidation numbers are changing from reactants to products, that can tell us, hey, this is not a redox reaction. Um, so, and again, just as a reminder, we don't want like the overall charge of a compound. We want individual oxidation numbers. So let's look at this example. It says, is this a redox reaction? So we just have to go through and assign oxidation numbers. Unless you have a polyatomic ion, you really should just be assigning normal like ionic charges to everything. So sodium is a group one metal, so we'll give it a plus one, and chloride would have to be negative one. And I get to silver nitrate, and when you have a compound like this, you you always can like take the polyatomic ion out if that's easier for you. Um, silver in this case is going to be plus one. Nitrate, I'll just write it separately is NO3 minus one. So I know each oxygen, I've got three oxygens, which are negative two each. I'm just gonna kinda of leave a blank for nitrogen because I really need to know what that individual one is. But when I add these totals together, I have to get the charge negative one because that's nitrate, nitrate's charge. So I can see that nitrate as a whole has an individual numbers of negative two for each oxygen. But if you do this math at the bottom, you can see that nitrogen itself is plus five. So we have plus one, plus five, and negative two. Silver chloride, we can see silver is still plus one. Chloride is still plus negative one, excuse me. Sodium is gonna be always plus one. And then notice we still have nitrate. So if nitrate is still nitrate, we don't really have to figure out the oxidation numbers because they're not gonna change from what we figured out before. So looking at Sodium stayed plus one as reactant and a product. Chloride stayed the same. Silver ion stayed the same. Nitrogen and oxygen, everything stayed the same. So is this redox? And the answer is no. And there are the numbers um, written above. So is this a redox reaction? Notice that was actually precipitation. So notice precipitation was its own type we've already discussed. So precipitation typically should not be can't be redox. But notice here's combustion. Is combustion going to be re redox? Most likely. And I'll tell you how what's a hint on some of these as well. Um, each hydrogen, remember, with a nonmetal is going to be um, positive one. So if we have four hydrogens, that means carbon has to be plus, oops, excuse me. Carbon in this case has to be negative four. Oxygen is an element, it's zero. Going to carbon dioxide, we said we're going to give oxygen a negative two. So now there are two negative two, so you can even do the little math below if that's helpful to think about this. So I have carbon's got to be something. I'm going to add those together. This is a um, compound, not an ion, has to equal zero overall. So I can see that all the oxygens together are negative four. So in this case, carbon's going to have to be plus four. And over here, water, negative two, oxygen, 
and to balance that out, each hydrogen is plus one. So let's see, did anything change? Well, carbon went from negative four to positive four. That's a huge change. Hydrogen stayed the same. Oxygen, though, went from zero to, and if we can use either oxygen, negative two. So, looking at that, we know for sure this is redox. One of these elements should have gone up in oxidation number, which we can see as the carbon. And if it's gone up in oxidation number, remember, we know that that is being oxidized. And if another element would have to go down in oxidation number from zero to negative two, and then that would be our reduction. So yes, this is a redox reaction. And then here's the summary of that. Um, and the, the clue I was gonna give you here is when you see an element in a reaction, elements have a zero oxidation number, and if it's actually reacting, it's gonna have to change to um, a, an, a, an oxidation number of some value other than zero. So if you see an element in a reaction, that's a huge hint that this is a redox reaction. Now, redox reactions are unique because we have this transfer of electrons, which is very different from precipitation acid base. So this type of balancing is really a process. Um, the first one we're going to do goes through all the steps and takes a little bit of time to balance, but we'll do a second example that is actually really short and very common on AP questions. Okay, first I'll go over the steps for redox balancing, but the most important thing is that you use this as a reference and that we'll refer back to this as we go through each of these steps. Because right now these steps aren't going to make a whole lot of sense, but I will keep referring back to these steps as we go through examples. So when the first, and again, this is going to be really different from any other type of balancing. Okay, so first we're going to have to split our reaction into two half reactions. Okay, and when I mean two halves, I mean the oxidate, what's being oxidized will be one, and what is being reduced is the other. So we'll balance each half of the reaction separately, and then at the end we will combine them to come up with our total overall balanced equation. All right, so we're going to start with one of the halves. First, I'll make sure all atoms other than oxygen and hydrogen are balanced using my coefficients, so that's nothing different. But here's where it gets a little different. If one side of the reaction has oxygen that's not balanced on the other side, I've got to add water to the side that needs more oxygen. So this is where it becomes a little different. And because I've done that, now I've introduced hydrogen, I'm going to have to, my next step is to balance hydrogens by adding the H plus ion. If you're going through this process, you've probably been told that um, your balancing or this reaction took place in acidic conditions, so that's where that H plus is coming from. After you've done that, you have to check the charges on each side of the reaction to see if the electrons of the charges are balanced, and they're not, they're not going to be. So you're going to have to add electrons to either side of the reaction. And again, this is going to depend on going back to oxidation or reduction. If it's a reduction half reaction, you're going to be adding some number of electrons to the reactant side. If it's oxidation, you know you have this loss of electrons, it would be some number of electrons to the product side. Okay, so then you'd go to the other half, you'd repeat those same steps. And then you'll look at the two halves and see the electrons. The, here's the key. One reaction can't lose electrons and the other half reaction gain more or less. The electrons have to be exactly the same number in both half reactions. So the, a lot of times they aren't, so how could we adjust for that? Well, we can multiply a half reaction, or sometimes both, by some integer to balance electrons. And again, that's going to change all the coefficients, but our goal here is to make sure the electrons are equal in both half reactions. Now, once our electrons in both half reactions are equal, we can add them back together. The electrons will have to be, like in one half reaction on the reactant side, one on the product. So when we add those, they will cancel out, and they must cancel out. Okay, and then you can double check at the end to make sure everything actually is balanced. So let's actually look at an example. Um, here's one that's printed out. It goes through step by step. I'm going to do a different one with you. I would recommend that you go through that yourself. Okay, so here is the first of two examples. So this first one, we're going to use more of the steps. 
balance the following reaction. Notice it looks strange. There's lots of charges. This, the reactants has, has oxygens. The products don't. You can already tell this is a little strange. I couldn't just throw in some coefficients and ever be able to balance this. So the first step, if you're looking at the rules, is to split this into two halves. So we have this iron half reaction and then this uh, manganese half reaction. And I can tell just from looking at the iron one that this is oxidation because the number is going from plus 2 to plus 3. It's increasing. Um, that's not a question we need to worry about right now, but we're going to continue this. So this is splitting it into halves. Now, for the oxidation half reaction, the steps are to balance elements other than oxygen and hydrogen first, but as you see, I don't have anything else besides the iron. So, and so it's referring to this iron in that step, and they are balanced. I have one and one, okay? Then it said to balance oxygens by adding water. Well, there's no oxygen, so I get to skip that step. And then it says to balance hydrogens by adding H+. Plus. Well, there's no H+, plus, so I also skip that step. So you only do the steps to, that apply to your particular half reaction. Now, the next step will never be skipped. You have to add electrons to one side to balance charges. So notice the iron side is plus 2. The, the reactant side, the product side is plus 3. I've got to add some number of electrons so that these both have the same charge. It doesn't matter what number it is as long as they're both identical. So if I add one electron, now I have plus two on both sides. That is balanced. So I'm actually done. Once you do the electrons, you should be done with that balancing that half reaction. So then I'm going to move on to the reduction half reaction. So I have one manganese and one manganese, so they're balanced. I don't have to, um, you know, that was the first step in balancing, step two. The second step, which we didn't have to do in the previous example, but you can see now we have these four oxygens that have to be balanced. So what do we do? We add four waters because that gives us the four oxygens that make both sides balance for oxygen. Now, by doing that, now we have this hydrogen that we've got to deal with and it is should be expected that's going to be our next step. So now I see, well, I have four water, which is eight hydrogens on this side. So I've been instructed to add eight H plus to the other side. Now they're balanced. Okay. Once we've done those steps, our next step is to balance charges by adding electrons. So notice before I've added these electrons, permanganate had a negative one overall charge and I had eight positives from the hydrogens. On the product side, I had positive two from the manganese ion and water is zero. So this side was overall positive two. And before I add electrons, this side was overall positive seven. So as you can see, positive seven doesn't equal positive two. I need electrons. This is why I chose to add five electrons. That makes both sides positive two and now I'm balanced that half reaction. So this is the balanced half reaction for the, um, the manganese and we already did the iron. So now I've got to look at those two balanced half reactions together and look at their electrons. So we had one electron on, as a product for the iron. We had five here. This is where we looked at it and said, hey, those have got to be exactly the same. So we were We've got to balance our electrons. So I had to multiply this half reaction by five, and then I'll add them together. And when I do that, since these electrons are products and these electrons are reactants, they cancel out. You should not have any electrons in your final answer. And that's what that is. You just have to be careful that you keep, and you could even circle them. Once these cancel for electrons, circle all the reactants and make sure you don't forget something and all those end up on the reactant side. And then maybe you could um, underline products or however you want to do it, but make sure you end up with all the products. And you could check overall charges and atoms and make sure that each side, the reactant side and the product side, both are identically identical for charges. Okay, this is the second example, and this one is a little bit more typical for the AP exam, and it's actually a little bit simpler. So I made you do the harder one first. You could still be asked to do some portion of that, but again, this, this might be more typical. So notice, here's this unbalanced reaction. 
make sure you realize why this is unbalanced. And the reason it's unbalanced is because it's a plus three charge on this side and this side is plus two. Otherwise, if you didn't notice that, you might think it actually is balanced, but as we can see, it is not. So first we split this into halves. So aluminum is one half and mag ma excuse me, magnesium is the other half. And then I've got to balance each half separately. So notice there's no oxygen and hydrogen, so I can just skip those steps because the magnesium um, atoms themselves were, were balanced. So if this is zero and this is plus two, I need these both both sides to have the same charge. So you can see this must be the oxidation half reaction as it's stated there because it's losing electrons. This side is zero and by adding the two electrons, I've reduced that side to zero as well. Both sides have to be equal. So we'll move on. The other um, rea half reaction one must be reduction. Notice there's an overall positive three on the reactant side. We have the element aluminum as a product. So this side is zero. We need those three electrons to balance that half reaction. There's nothing else to balance. No, the aluminum's already balanced, oxygen's not there, hydrogen wasn't there. So you can see this is a lot less complicated. So if we think about it, we had two electrons here, three electrons here, and this is where you can stop and check. Your electrons for the half reactions could never be on the same side of both reactions. If that happens, you've made a mistake because they must cancel, and the only way they can cancel is really have to have two components. It has to, they have to be the exact same value and they have to be on opposite sides of the reaction. So we can see three and two aren't balanced. Okay, so notice that we'll take the aluminum half reaction and double it. We'll take the magnesium half reaction and triple it because by doing that, it makes our electrons six on each side. Now, don't forget, you've got to change all the coefficients, not just the electrons. So when I add those two together, my six electrons cancel out. Now, if you go through, everything is balanced for atoms and charge. Okay, for redox reactions, we could also be asked something about a particulate diagram. So here's some I found. Um, I think this is actually from a video, but it just said, which of these diagrams illustrates oxidation? Which one illustrates reduction? Explain and write the half reaction for each. So as you can see, the arrows are the key here. So we see this is in the solution, copper two plus ion, and it's going to a solid. So really you're supposed to realize that arrow means it's doing this. So the two electrons would have to be here. We'll do the same thing. Notice zinc is the opposite. Those two electrons are leaving the solid zinc. So by just writing these two, we should be able to figure out that reduction is gaining electrons and oxidation is losing. So hopefully that was not too bad to figure out. Now, there are some labs that we could um, be asked about, and we're going to, we talked about the first two and the first PowerPoint, and this is the redox titration. Um, you may have done a titration before, but if not, it's just a special lab that uses burettes. So you might get to do one in, um, in this unit. If not, you'll definitely get to do one with the acid base unit and um, unit eight. So titration is just a lab method and really it's to determine an unknown concentration, okay? And a fancy word for that is an analyte, but basically we're, we're trying to figure out a molarity of something, okay? And we're gonna measure it against something called a titrant. And all it means when it says standardized is that we do know this concentration. So basically we have two reactants. One we want to know the molarity for and the other one we know the molarity. So we have ways to know moles of the standard. So what we're gonna be using as a burette and um, again, we'll talk about redox titrations here and there are other acid-based ones that go into a lot more detail in unit eight. So here's what a burette looks like. Um, it's, it starts with zero at the top. It measures going down. Here, this valve is called a stopcock. 
when you open the valve so that the valve is parallel to the um, to the cylinder it's open okay so basically you usually start at zero if possible you drain out needed um, solution drop by drop and you can read how much you've used from the meniscus on the burette okay this is a very precise volume measuring instrument and again just some reminders it does start at zero so you're measuring going down so as you can tell from this um, again we're going to read from the bottom of the meniscus it's we used the the solution went below 46 but notice the way this scale goes each of these unmarked graduations if you count them are 0.1 milliliter those the ones that aren't marked we can see that this would be 0 0.5 0 0.6 0 0.7 0 0.8 but see it's between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 so I can't just say point, it's 46.8. I have to estimate a next digit. So to me, it looks like it's barely over 0.8. So I est estimated a 2 in that next decimal place. Maybe you thought it was a 3. Maybe you thought it was a 1. That last digit doesn't have to be the same for everyone as long as we all have these first three and we have that fourth estimated digit. If you drop that 2, you have the wrong significant figures and your volume is incorrect. So we have to estimate that last digit. Now some other important um, vocabulary for titrations is the equivalence point. This is the point where the two things that are reacting have exactly reacted. Okay, This is where we're going to be able, this is the volume we need to know so that we can figure out the mo unknown molarity. Okay, so this is where we have an exact reaction between the reactants. And then it's like, well, how do we know when that's actually happening? We need some kind of um, property that will tell us. And so if it's a color change, like a lot of times this will add an extra um, um, substance called an indicator, which would change color to tell us when this equivalence point is happening, or... Um, sometimes, like in a redox titration, sometimes one of the reactants that's involved actually changes color. So that tells us, hey, you're there, you need to stop the reaction. Okay, it's, it's over. So endpoint is where you have this observable event like a color change. So here's the burette. Here's a very common titration. This is a balanced net ionic redox reaction. Um, and this Fe2 plus that's a reactant is colorless. And then when we've added just enough of the potassium permanganate solution from the burette, it turns this, you know, we're looking for this kind of lavender purpley color. And that's when we know, when we see that color, we know it's the end point and we have the equivalence point and we can stop. So what we'd want to know here is some kind of information about one of these reactants, okay? Maybe our standard is the permanganate ion solution and we're trying to figure out the molarity of the iron. Let's look at um, an example so we'll kind of see what this is going to look like. Um, I included this. This is just kind of a general um, slide to say so that you'll know what kind of calculations you're going to be doing because notice we have molarities and we're going to have volumes so we can get moles from that. So I'm going to read a volume from the burette and that's of the standard. Okay, so usually your titrant, the standard solutions in the burette, it can be different, but that's just kind of one common example. So I'll use the volume from the burette and the molarity that I've been given in the lab. I'll multiply those and I'll get moles of the you know, how many moles from that solution did actually react it. Then I'll have to do a mole ratio, that's what the coefficients are giving me, to the other reactant, maybe that iron ion concentration, okay? So once I do the mole ratio, then I'll know the moles of the unknown solution, but I do know how much I started with in the flask. I measured a certain volume and then I can do moles divided by liters, and I'll know what my answer is. But let's look at an example. 
Okay, so we that's just the general information about calculations business. Let's actually try one. So I want us to use the same um, example, this balanced redox reaction, and we were told a solution of potassium permanganate ion. Okay, so we're told that a potassium permanganate ion excuse me, potassium permanganate solution has a molarity of 0 0.025 molar. So if we're told the concentration, we know that that is our titrant, that is our standard solution. And we were told that during the course of the titration, it took 25.3 milliliters from the burette for the reaction to occur. Okay, so here's our information about our potassium permanganate solution. Now, we were also told that initially only 20 milliliters, and this was, they said it was an iron to nitrate solution. Okay, so we used 20 milliliters of that. So here are the questions we want to answer. Okay, first, I want us to answer what are the number of moles in the standard solution? Okay, so that would be our moles of KMnO4, which is exactly the same as our moles of the permanganate ion because there's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that's our first question. Our second question is what is the moles in our unknown? And again, the moles of our unknown, it, it, we were told it was iron to nitrate, which is exactly equal to the iron two plus ion. Okay, the moles of iron two plus ion. Again, one to one mole ratio. So even though they're told, telling us these solutions that contain our spectator ions like K plus and nitrate, we just can ignore those because notice in our balanced equation, Remember, spectator ions will not be present. Okay, so that's our second question we're gonna answer. And the third one is, once we know these moles in our unknown solution, we're going to solve for its concentration. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna just transfer this to the next slide, just so we have a lot more room to set this up. So our first order of business is how many moles were in the potassium permanganate solution? So we had a we had a 25.3 milliliters that was used from the burette, okay? And so we, the first thing we need to do is change that to liters. You need to divide by a thousand, okay? So we've divided, divided by a thousand. So if we take our molarity, and let's double check our numbers. So it's a 0.025 molar solution. If we take our 0.025 molar solution, remember mol, molarity means moles over liters, so if I take molarity and multiply times my volume, that gives me my moles. So when I do that math on my calculator, let me see, 6.33, and again, you, these numbers you would expect to be using a calculator, that gives me my moles of you can write KMnO4 or just the permanganate ion. Remember they're a one-to-one -one mole ratio, so it's gonna be the same answer. That's my first question. The next question is, well, how many moles of the iron two plus ion had to react with this? So my next question is moles of iron that in the reaction. Well, I all I can do is start from my Mole, known moles. This is what I know was in, used from the burette, was this many moles of the permanganate ion. So now I've got to do my mole ratio. So let's double check our reaction. Well, we know that for every one mole of the permanganate ion, it took five moles of iron two plus to react with it. So I've got my one mole of permanganate ion over, I'm solving for, five moles of iron two plus. So when I multiply that times five, I see that I get 
3.16 times 10 to the negative third moles. So that's the iron 2 plus ion. So I've answered, this is question 1, and then I've answered question 2. And the final question was, what is the molarity of the iron 2 plus ion? Well, molarity, that's a 6, we know is moles over liters. So to get my answer, I need to take my moles that I just solved for, still on my calculator, and I need to divide it by my beginning volume. So remember we said in the flask, we started with 20 milliliters. Now, again, I can't use milliliters. I've got to change it like we did up here. So I've got 0 0.020 liters. So I do that math. And then my final answer is 0.158 molar. So this is what a redox titration, the math that goes along with it, is going to look like.